Well, we still have a few more to join, but I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lacey Fussell with Muse Wine Management. Thank you all for taking the time to join us today for our Alisos Canyon AVA Masterclass. We've got a great lineup of producers for you. Hopefully most of you have the wines in front of you. Uh, Matt Ketman is our moderator today. So Matt, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you. Great, thank you, Lacey. Uh, as we were just talking about, a, a couple of you have joined us for all four of these now. We've done uh, a number of these master classes on the AVAs of Santa Barbara County, uh, including Ballard Canyon, Happy Canyon, Santa Rita Hills, and now Alisos Canyon. Uh, I gotta say, I'm, don't tell the other people, but I'm kind of most excited about this one. Uh, one, because there's awesome wines that we get to taste that are, that are different and some have some age. Uh, we got Gamay. I love Gamay. So um, that's fun. Annalisa's Canyon is, uh, you know, our newest appellation in Santa Barbara County. It was, it was created just in August of 2020. Uh, I'm going to start a slideshow now because it relates to this. So let me start that if I can figure it out. Uh, there we go. Present. Okay. Is that working? Yes. Great. Um, so, uh, as many of you know, I recently wrote a book called Vines and Vision, The Winemaker of Santa Barbara County. I've been, in, I've been a writer for the Santa Barbara Independent uh, since 1999, covering uh, food and wine, among other things. And I started reviewing wines for wine enthusiasts back in uh, 2014. So it's been about seven years of doing like 200, 300 wines a month. And then over the last couple of years, I worked on this book, Vines and Vision, The Winemakers of Santa Barbara County with McDuff Everton, other than plugging that book, the, the relevance is that um, Aliso's Canyon uh, became an AVA just before we went to press. So we were able to actually include a chapter rather than having Aliso's Canyon in our, in our uh, subsection of you know, Appalachians to come, we were able to include Aliso's Canyon AVA uh, as, um, as a chapter. And so here is the, the spread from our book of that. This is the Thompson vineyard property, you see some vines there, you, you see less vines than you see the actual property here, but this gives a nice look at Lisos Canyon and these rolling uh, green hills that you see there, which are what they look like right about now. Um, to set the scene a little bit, I mean, personally, Lisos Canyon means something to me too, because uh, my wife and I's first date, overnight date, out of town date, was actually in Lisos Canyon. We went to uh, Bedford Thompson Winery. This is back in like 2003. Um, the tasting room was basically a, a folding card table um, with, uh, you know, some wines there. And I remember drinking a Bud Light for some reason. Um, and uh, St Stephen Bedford still makes wine. He's now in Los Alamos, uh, you know, which is nearby. Um, and the Thompson Vineyard is obviously a big source of grapes. And we're going to taste a bunch of that today. So um, we're still married. Uh, so that's good. And um, must be something special about the place. Um, to give you kind of a scene here where we are. Um, you know, Santa Barbara's way down here. Uh, Santa Maria's up here. Uh, Los Alamos, town of Los Alamos is right here. And then the Los Alamos Valley is this gap between the Santa Maria Valley AVA and the San Inez Valley AVA. And then if you, you know, you know the Santa Rita Hills is, is right here on the west side of the San Inez Valley. Um, so let me dial in here a little bit more. We're dialing in more. So this is the Los Alamos Valley here. Uh, and Elisa's Canyon is kind of cut out of this small area right here. And here is the you know, tentative or the actual map. Um, they still haven't really cut the official AVA maps yet um, by the by the Vintners Association, but this is this is what we're looking at here. So, um, acreage wise, it's about 5,700, almost 5,800 acres. Uh, covers nine square miles. But really, as far as I know, as unless anything was just recently planted, uh, it's only nine vineyards and about 250 acres of grapes. So it's really quite small. Um, it was planted, you know, the, the Thompson was planted in the mid 1990s. Uh, so grapes have been grown and here and made into wine for quite a long time. And, and Andrew Murray will attest, you know, he started as kind of a, a wonder kid uh, uh, of uh, Santa Barbara County. Now he's more of a grizzled vet and he's been making wine and uh, what is now Lisa's Canyon for a really long time. We get to taste some of that too. So um, the climate, you know, the days are pretty warm in this area during the summer, um, but it's got the cool nights because it, there's this San Antonio Creek um, let's see. So this Lacey and her husband make these great Google maps for us. Um, so um, these are the vineyards we're going to taste from. Martian Ranch, Thompson Vineyard, Watch Hill Vineyard, all very close to each other. Santa Barbara's down here. 
Santa Maria is up here. Los Alamos is right down here. Uh, here's another view. And you can see how close the, the ocean is here. So you have um, this San Antonio Creek uh, Valley is basically cuts through here somewhere, probably right here, um, goes out to Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is what, you know, all this is out here. Um, and and uh, it's only about 20 miles away uh, to uh, the ocean. And so you're sucking in, you know, that, that fog and that cool windy air um, on a pretty regular basis. So you get these 50 degree, you know, diurnal temperature swings, which as we all know, is very important to retaining acidity and freshness in wine, uh, especially during a spot where the warm days can, can get it quite ripe. Um, let's see what else. It's, it's a very varied appellation. Uh, there's, you know, there's, there's about 500 different feet of 500, 600 feet in elevation swings. Um, it, it's extremely uh, hilly. So you have aspects kind of on all, all sides. You can plant, you know, south facing, almost north facing, west facing, east facing. Um, and then the soils are really varied too. So it's kind of a base of sandstone and sand, and there's also a bunch of shale there. And then you have this like this kind of streak of limestone that goes through that, that you, as we all know, uh, winemakers get all um, excited about limestone and, and you see a little bit of that in this region as well. Um, so we're gonna be exploring all that with the winemakers we have today. Uh, let's do this flyover, which is always fun now that you have some basic information. I don't know how to get it in a presentation, so we gotta do it like this, um, but here we go. So let's see, let me back it up just a bit here. So we have Santa Barbara here. We're looking basically east. So Santa Barbara is a weird city that faces um, the south uh, uh, on the shoreline. Um, but we're basically looking east and then we're gonna fly in kind of coming down from the west. So you have Santa Maria's back over here, uh, flying in. And so um, Aliso's Canyon, the canyon itself is kind of right here. Uh, but the Appalachian kind of grabbed up, you know, a good amount of this stuff here. Uh, so watch hills in it as well. And I think this spins around for us a little bit. And we kind of get the general idea here. So we'll start at Thompson Vineyard with, with Angela's wines. Uh, then we move to Martian Ranch with Jessica's wines from Story of Soil. Gamays, which we are going to hear a lot about, which is cool. Uh, then we cut back up the hill here to Watch Hill uh, with Andrew's wines. Uh, we've got, as you know, the 2018 and then for the end of the taste in the 2011. Um, and then we're back at Thompson um, for the Jaffer's wines with our winemaker, Stephen Searle. Uh, and uh, I'm excited about those because it's a, actually we have a cool climate, Petit Syrah, which is something you don't see that often. Uh, and I think it really does kind of exhibit these cool climate qualities that you might expect from a Syrah, um, but it's in, you know, it's in a um, Petit Syrah. So without further ado, uh, let's move on to Angela from A Tribute to Grace. Um, the wines you guys have are the 2019 Grenache Blanc, which we'll start with, and the 2018 Grenache. Uh, Angela is well known as a uh, Grenache fanatic. Uh, and make some of the most, I think, kind of ethereal and, um, you know, terroir driven, uh, you know, transparent Grenache uh, out of anywhere in the, in the world at the moment right now. So, um, Angela, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us uh, about the Grenache Blanc and then the, the Grenache and how you got into uh, becoming so fascinated with Grenache. And, of course, a little bit about Lisa's Canyon. My pleasure. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I have uh, two wines from Elisos Canyon, which is a really exciting area for us to work with. We moved to Los Alamos in 2012 from Napa, and I've worked with vineyards sort of throughout. Oh gosh, have I lost everyone? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I just stopped sharing my screen so we could see you better. Oh no, I seem to have lost everyone. Hmm, Los Alamos has really dodgy internet reception, which Jess can attest to. I'm just going to try and log back on because I can see no one, which is unusual. We can hear you. Can you see me or just hear me? We can see you too. Well, that's kind of spooky. <laughs> um, quite, oh, there we are. Thank you. Um, so we work with vineyards as far south as eastern Los Angeles, as far north as the Sierra foothills. 
um, but we chose this to be our home base and to start a family. So we've lived here nine years. Um, my first job in the Valley was at Demetria. I got to work for minimum wage in the vineyard, which was amazing, extremely hot. I learned what hand hoeing is like in the middle of a California summer, which was an amazing introduction. And then made my vintage that year at Martian. Um, the year after that, made it with Andrew Murray for two vintages, I think. And then we came to where we are now, which is about 10 minutes out of Los Alamos in a little town called Orchid. Um, but prior to that, I've had, I think, I think this is my seventh address in California. So I've been an absolute um, gypsy winemaker, I think. I've traveled from cellar to cellar working initially harvest internships up to assistant winemaker and I've made Grace in the corner. And Grace is now 14 different Grenache bottlings and two of them are from East Canyon, which is so close to where we live. So, um, Grenache Blanc to start with, this is brand new for me. I started making this in 2018. This is our second vintage 2019. Um, my dear English husband was telling me for years we should bring a white wine into the family and I kept saying no. And in 2018, he got to know the amazing fisherman that manages the vineyard at Thompson and a friendship began and I began to see how beautiful their fruit was. And thankfully for fishing, we managed to get some fruit. Um, I had known the site from Adam Tolmark. He always made a Thompson Vineyard Grenache, which I'd loved when I lived in Ojai. And I'm not sure where the fruit went in between, but we managed to get his old fruit, which is uh, planted to Alban too. And then the Grenache Blanc, I believe, is the fruit that Jeff has used to get. So. Um, what, I mean, is there anything about, anything about, um, can you hear me, Angela? Your internet it isn't that good. Yeah, let me turn you on. Sorry, this reception is terrible. Okay, I can hear you. Is there anything about Grenache Blanc winemaking that's similar to your Grenache winemaking, or is they completely different processes? Mm -mm. No, um, there's no foot treating involved. There's no. Uh, I don't know. I've always made red wine, so white wine feels quite hands-off, but intentionally on. It's a very different type of wine, maybe essential. I'm not looking at stems, I'm only looking at fruit. I think the first year we picked this fruit in November and I wasn't really expecting Grenache Blanc to ripen that late. It was all of 22-1, I think, when we picked it. Um, but it's, pretty simple. I direct press, it goes into a barrel, it undergoes fermentation. Um, following primary, I will rack it and keep it on its leaves throughout Alavage. First year was 17 months, second year was 11 months. But it's pretty simple. I mean, I it's all about sight. I don't use any new wood, so it's all about where it grows and I guess when I pick it. But this fruit's amazing. Um, there's lots of flint in the soil, which I haven't seen in this area before. Um, and there's a minerality that comes through both from that flint and perhaps from the depth of it. And there's a sort of a fine linear direction that I enjoy, but the finish is all stone. And is this makes the only... it fun to pair with paella. That's my favorite pairing. And this is the only white you make? Yes, um, we made, we bought just under two tons. So it's the the one and only vintage number two. Yeah, it, it was fun. We released the first one a month after shutdown and I was expecting it to be sort of a by the glass beauty and then all of our accounts shut like everyone else's. So we sold pretty much a hundred cases through the tasting room. And then we released this on March 3rd, which has been work with this fruit, we would love to get a little bit more because I think people are, are thirsty for white wine at the moment, at least people that come to the tasting room are, um, but we are getting all the fruit we can. This was planted in 2007. And you you opened a tasting room in Los Alamos, Sorry, uh, you opened a tasting room in Los Alamos pretty recently, right? 
Well, yes and no. We opened it in 2019, but at the very end of 2019, and then we had to shut, and then we reopened in July, and then we shut again in November, and then we reopened two weeks ago. So I feel like my time here hasn't been that great, but our lease has been longer. It's nice to be open again. Right. I'm going to share my screen again because we have a couple of slides uh, from from Thompson, I believe. So. Um, so Thompson's sitting here, uh, Lisa's Canyon Road goes right here. Uh, you can you see it readily from the road. Um, this road, Lisa's Canyon Road connects Fox and Canyon Road, which is over here to 101. So if you're ever driving uh, from San Francisco to LA, you're passing Lisa's Canyon Road. It's a turn, it's a noticeable turn there just south of Los Alamos. Um, here's a beautiful shot that comes from our book. Um, here's Angela, is that is that with uh, Thompson Grenache by any chance or do you know? I can't actually see the photos you're sharing. Okay, sorry. It could uh, be, chances are. Here's the uh, wine we're drinking right now. And then here's a map of uh, Thompson Vineyard. Um, so where's the GB? Oh, so it's the Grenache Blanc is down here, uh, closer to the road looks like. Um, and then here's the, the Grenache. So why don't we move to the, to the Grenache, uh, Angela, and tell us a little bit about why of all the grapes in the world you found a fascination with Grenache? Okay, I would love to. Now I've got my um, screen working. I can see both of what you're sharing. Um, Grenache does not grow in my homeland, so I didn't, I didn't know how beautiful it was until 2002 when I came to California to do what was only meant to be one harvest. Um, I'd worked in a in a wine shop during film school and loved the storytelling aspect of wine, but I had thought my um, life would be making documentaries. So I came here to travel for three months and taste a Grenache and I'm still here 19 years later. Never made documentaries, but love uh, this expression specifically. So I, um, it has the most balance of all the varietals to me and it has the most um, the most balance between yin and yang. Um, I love Grenache on the on the side of yin, but I use a lot of whole cluster, which keeps the earth influence um, more of a frame, but definitely evident. Occasionally, I'll work with a site where I won't use any whole cluster, and this Thompson is one of those. Uh, that wasn't Thompson, but it looks very similar. That was another <laughs> Alban block. <laughs> um, so That's Alban. Awesome. Clonally, I've gotten to know the Grenache clones quite well. And Alban 2, I've never seen anywhere but Thompson. I've worked with Alban 1. Alban 2, maybe Andrew knows a bit more about the Alban clones, but Alban 2, uh, there's, there's quite an amazing amount of tannins in the stems to the point where I thought for my first vintage of Thompson, I would do a de-stemmed fermentation. So this is 100% de-stemmed. It's one of the only de-stemmed wines I've ever made. Um, we made 37 cases. Unfortunately, I don't have it in front of me to taste because I have one bottle left at home and I texted my husband to bring it in because I thought I had it here, but he must be busy building. Um, but it's and a very- I, I, Sorry, where, where, does the, where does the Thompson Grenache and the Elisa's Canning Grenache, generally speaking, fit in your lineup of all these Grenaches from across the state? I mean, is it on the fruitier side, the earthier side, where, where do you put it? So based on how the fruit tasted, I assumed it would be on the broodier side. But once fermentation was underway, obviously it was too late to add any stems. I think it would have been beautiful with some of the, the cardamom sandalwood, which I get from lignified stems. But it turned out to be one of the prettiest wines I've ever made. Um, Alvin to me is a very dark, intense, uh, kind of a bruiser for want of a bit of a word it sort of reminds me of an old gnarly spanish grenache sometimes an australian grenache but this is very delicate the fermentation was beautiful i only do native ferments um but this was pretty quick for de-stemmed i find stem inclusion increases the speed of fermentation there's a lot of nutrients obviously in stems but for de-stemmed ferment this this was relatively fast and as a style, people likened it to the Highlands, which is the most ethereal of all the wines that I make. It's difficult to know whether Alban II is this expression or Thompson is this expression. It's also an older vineyard. It's planted in 97, which for us is relatively old, apart from 
the two vineyards we worked with from the early 1900s, most of them are planted in the 2000s. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a, if, oh, is this him? Oh, you let him. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. Now I have it. What a hero. Just um, okay. I might just have to quickly open it. I think okay. the color also looks a lot like Santa Barbara Highlands. So a lot of the Grenaches I make are very, very, um, quite a bit darker tonality wise and Highlands and Thompson are both certainly quite a bit paler, which I love. Um, yeah. Andrew's wondering, Angela, if you've ever done skin contact on the Grenache Blanc. I mean, this is only your second vintage, so you haven't had a lot of experimental time, but. Who was wondering that, Andrew? Andrew Murray, yeah. Very good question, Andrew Murray. Um, I think it would be <laughs> an interesting varietal to do that with. I tried to get more fruit last year with the hope that I could just do a small amount of skin ferment, but I couldn't. Hopefully this year I can get a bit more and experiment with that. Have you done it, Andrew? We, we um, I wish I was drinking your Grenache Blanc right now. Um, sorry. We, we, we did sort of in an effort to try to add texture to the wine. We did um, some skin ferment and then just some crush and hold in the cold room for about 24 hours, um, pre-fermentation skin contact. And both were interesting. Um, it just added a little bit more something, something to the wine. So um, it was just, we were searching to make Grenache Blanc more profound um, than we were making it. So uh, ultimately we just stopped making it, um, but I can't wait to try yours. I'll bring you some. Uh, does any, anyone have any questions directly for Angela? We can do it at the end too, but if someone has one right now before we move on to Jessica and some Gamay Noir, um, now would be a good time. Or we just hold those comments uh, for the end. Wines are obviously delicious. I've been a big fan ever since you started sending me wines, Angela. And I love the, uh, I mean, your whole lineup of Grenaches are just, I think, more and more interesting year after year, um, showing a lot more of all of it, you know, from, from vintage to vintage. So um, they're always fun to open your boxes. So I'll keep sending them. <laughs> all right. Thank you. All right. Um, Let's move into uh, some Gamay Noir, one of my uh, favorite wines these days um, across the board. So uh, Jessica, let me pin you here. Um, Jessica Gaska is uh, behind the brand Story of Soil. She uh, got into wine because um, her uncle actually is, uh, is kind of a longtime winemaker up here in, in the Santa Maria Valley. Um, so Jessica, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and a little bit about your brand, and then we can talk about uh, Gamay Noir and Martian Vineyard and Elisa's Canyon. And I'll okay. start these slides in a little bit too, so. Um, thanks for, for having me, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, my uncle, uh, Gary Burke, owner and winemaker of Costa de Oro Winery, um, and he owns a little vineyard in Santa Maria, 30 acre vineyard, uh, it's called Gold Coast Vineyard. And he was pretty much my mentor from day one. Um, and still to this day is very important to me and, and just an all, all around salt of the earth human being. Um, and I started my brand in 2012. I was working at a winery uh, called Sanguis, which is actually where I got my first introduction to the Alisos Canyon um, area. Uh, we worked with Watch Hill and Thompson Vineyard at Sanguis. Um, and I was with Matias for about three and a half years. Um, left in 2013. So I'd started my own brand in 2012, making some Pinot Noir and a little bit of Syrah from Ballard Canyon, Larner Vineyard. And every year, little by little, we grew. Um, so I started at, in 2012 at 150 cases. And today we make 2000 cases and everything is single vineyard, single varietal. So I don't do any blending. Um, I really kind of want to teach the story of Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara climate, uh, typicity and terroir for the different varietals that I, I work with. Um, I'm currently working with about 13 different vineyards and that does mostly stay within Santa Barbara, although I do also work with two vineyards, uh, Grenache and a Pinot Noir vineyard in Edna Valley. Um, but most of my vineyards in Santa Barbara County from east to west and from north to south, so San Inez as well as in Santa Maria. Um, 
I started working with Martian Vineyard in 2017. Um, at that point, that was kind of my big leap up to uh, putting my big girl pants on and um, increasing my production. And so I was working with a few Pinot Noir vineyards, um, Sau Blanc and some Syrah and, and decided I wanted to work with something else to kind of push my my boundaries and, and push, you know, my learning curve here in Santa Barbara County and actually went up to Martian Ranch originally to look at their Albarino. Um, and as I was there and tasted through some things, just decided that Albarino wasn't for me, but they had a little bit of Gamay. Um, and at that time in 2017, I was kind of a, a Beaujolais freak, uh, really enjoyed drinking um, the Cru Beaujolais, um, as you guys all know, you can spend, you know, $200 for a beautiful bottle of Pinot Noir or more, but you can spend 50 or 60 bucks for a really good bottle of Cru Beaujolais. Um, and so I was kind of going down that journey and, and decided to work with this, this fruit and super geeky. Um, it's a hundred percent, both, both the 17 you're going to taste and the 2020 are not, uh, different in the way that they were made. Um, they are both 100% whole cluster, uh, semi-carbonic, and uh, it's both of them are aged for a short amount of time, not like Nouveau, but uh, for about six months in some neutral oak um, wines, unfined, unfiltered, both of them. I, I was surprised to taste them this morning, just when I opened the bottles, like how how much savory character they have, which I which I am fascinated by because so many, so many Gamays and, and even Cru Beaujolais, they're basically all fruit driven. And these are obviously, they have a fruit side, a very strong fruit side, but there's also this kind of like savory tone underneath it all, which is I think really kind of much more interesting than a lot of the, with a lot of the Gamays that I really love that are, that are more kind of single noted. This has a lot more going on, both of the ones too for me. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good region for Gamay. So uh, there's not a lot of Gamay uh, planted in Santa Barbara County. We're talking in, in the total across all of the vineyards. Um, I want to say there's right around 15 to 18 acres planted. So super small amounts. Um, Presquil has a few acres. Pence has a few acres. Martian a few. I know there's they're starting to plant some out a little bit in Santa Rita Hills. Um, for me, Aliso's Canyon, right, we're talking about Aliso's Canyon. So super ideal for growing this grape. Um, if we look at Obviously, don't want to you know compare Santa Barbara necessarily to Beaujolais, but uh, if you look at climates, Beaujolais, although it's connected somewhat to Burgundy, and that's kind of what we associate with the grape, it's actually the region. It's it's a little bit warmer than Burgundy. It's a little bit closer to temperatures of the Rhone, which you know if you look at Elisa's Canyon and we're talking to Angela with Grenache and and Syrah and Petite Syrah, that's a little bit warmer. Um, so it's not as cool as Santa Maria. It's not as cool as Santa Rita Hills, um, but it's definitely cooler than San Inez, Ballard Canyon, um, and, and uh, I'm forgetting one, Los Olivos, ABA. Um, well, and the degree day is that when I was looking up some of the research, I think it's on your guys' the deck that you got, but the degree days are between Burgundy and Northern Rhone. So that makes sense, right? I mean, that's where Beaujolais would be essentially. Right. Um, and, and for me, Martian, um, it's interesting because I actually went back through my notes to look up the days that I picked. Um, so, so 2017, uh, I think I picked September 1st. And in 2020, I think I picked like September 2nd or something like that. It was pretty close, but I actually picked. So if you guys have the, the Gamays in front of you, the 2020 is a little bit lighter in alcohol. Um, actually picked it a little bit earlier because we were having all those weird heat spikes in 2020 where California was on fire um, and it just kept getting hotter and hotter. So had it we, had we had not had the heat spikes, I think I would have let it hang out a little bit. I mean, obviously it's really high acid, um, but it is lower alcohol, 12.8, whereas the 2017, actually, and the 2018 and the 2019 mostly came in at around 13.4, 13.5, something like that. Um, you know how, how old the vines are out there? Did they plant yeah. the Gamay when they planted Martian or later? Yeah, it was planted in 2007, so they're fairly young vines. Um, they do practice biodynamics, um, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, all of the vineyards I work with are either organic biodynamic or sustainable, and um, I think I work with five uh, biodynamic vineyards. And so Martian planted in 2007, 
out of the gate decided to do biodynamic. So by 2010, they were certified biodynamic. And, and I mean, the, I, I didn't really mention this at the top, but it's kind of obvious that the Alisos Canyon is kind of a Rhone focused area, you know, a lot of Syrah particularly, and then other Rhones. Uh, but there are, there are other, other things popping up and Martian was one of the first to kind of check it out other ways, right? So they have Albarino, they have the Gamay, they have Tempranillo, I believe. Um, what else, do they have anything else kind of funky out there? No, that it's, it's Syrah, Grenache, Viognier, Tempranillo, Albarino, Gamay. I, don't think they have any, uh, they might have something else, another one or two varietals, but. And they're not making uh, their own, or they're not making their own wine anymore and they're selling all the grapes? Yep. That yeah. just ended last uh, two, two vintages ago. They stopped making their own wine. Yeah. I think they're still selling it, but they're not making it anymore. Yep. Yep. Um, here's some of the labels. Here's a picture of Jessica with Mary Hebner, who's actually the wife of Macduff Everton, who I did the book with, and she's an artist, so it's kind of a cool shot. She's a fun lady. Um, there's Jessica, and uh, what vineyard is that? Is that that Martian? is that is Martian? Yeah, that, Martian. that was uh, that was our excitement post for the new AVA. You know, I, I again, since we do single vineyard, single varietal, Anytime we can really help the consumer understand where where our, our wine comes from, you know, it's pretty exciting. So to have Elisa's Canyon uh, as a new AVA is, I think, pretty important for all of us as winemakers. Yeah, what's that? I mean, what's that mean uh, when it comes term when it comes to explaining the wines you're making? Is it is it helpful to have these things broken down even more? Um, yeah, I mean, at my tasting room, right? We really focus on education. Um, I'm in the tasting room a lot, and it's really important for me to. That is Gamay. That's our Gamazing. Uh, we like to call it Gamazing because um, it's super fun and funky. Um, in, in the tasting room, right, so all my two, 2000 cases are DTC. Um, I have a small amount that we do save for some really fantastic restaurant programs, but outside of that, everything is sold through the tasting room. Um, and for me, I really really want the consumer to learn about Santa Barbara. I always say first and foremost, Story Soil is mine, but I am first and foremost a champion of Santa Barbara County. I really believe that what we have here is extremely special. Um, our climate is absolutely ideal for growing the, you know, the different grapes that we grow. And so I really champion Santa Barbara and try to teach those that come through my tasting room a little bit about, you know, where we are in the world of, in the world of wine and how special this place is. Um, and so to have, you know, we have a big map in our tasting room and we use maps a lot to kind of talk about the different regions. We talk about the difference in temperatures, you know, from Santa Rita Hills all the way over to, to San Inez up through, through Santa Maria. Um, and so to be able to point to Alisos Canyon now as a marker, I think it just gives the customer, you know, the, the, the consumer more education and the more education we all know that we have about wine um you know the more we can enjoy the product that we're going out to buy so great and then do you do you make um some rounds too i i can't recall yeah um i make so predominantly i make pinot noir i work with five different pinot noir vineyards make a little bit of gruner veltliner uh sauvignon blanc a little bit of rosé now this was my first year for rosé um and now i work with uh couple of Syrah vineyards. Um, actually, Syrah was my first 2012 Larner vineyard. I also work with Duverita. And then last year in 2019, I got a little Grenache happy. So I actually, uh, as of last year, work with three different Grenache vineyards. Um, so yeah, a little bit of Rome, definitely. And where's your tasting room now? In Los Olivos. In Los Olivos, okay. Yeah. But you moved from the one that I saw you at, because I was in there and it's now a cider place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got kicked out uh, by our landlord, uh, which, <laughs> you know, it, blessings in disguise. You know, I was devastated that we had to move, but we moved and we love, love, love the east side of Los Olivos. Uh, some really cool neighbors, uh, just really good vibe over there. Great. Well, thank you, Jessica. Uh, these are great wines. Does anyone have any uh, particular questions uh, for Jessica right now? There's some in the chat. When I have one, Explain it when I've got my slides on, I can't see the chat. Um, and Patrick's asking, uh, Patrick Comiskey's asking, Martian's the only source for Gamay and Lisos Canyon. I believe that's true, right? Nolan didn't plant any. 
No, I, I think I think that's it. And then the closest would be up north uh, in in the Orchid Santa Maria area for Presqu'ile, um, and then right. out in Santa Rita Hills. And then uh, Leslie asks, is there a meaning behind your logo? Uh, that's kind of a fun little story. Um, there wasn't any necessarily beginning thought behind it. I just kind of had this this vision of what I wanted it to look like and go back and forth with the the uh, graphic designer um, and eventually came came to this. I finally drew it out on a piece of paper with you know a pen and and took us took a screenshot with my with my iPhone and sent it to him. So he he doctored it together. Uh, this came back and I was like, yes, this is awesome. And then fast forward to when we opened our tasting room in 2017, there was actually a soil scientist that came through our doors and said, do you know that this actually looks like, and I, I have to print out the, the email from him. And he sent us a shot of this certain type of soil that looks like this little starburst. Um, and I can't remember what, what, the, what the soil was, but it was just kind of full circle. There is no rhyme or reason to it. It was just something that was up in the brain that kind of came out for it. I have a quick question. Um, I, I thought it was interesting because we have a 17 and a 20 and you called out uh, 2017 as being um, kind of hotter and having the fires, which we did, um, but we had also um, fires in 2020. So I was wondering if that also affected um, any ripening or picking decisions. Cause it, it sounds like of most of the varieties this one would be a, a little bit earlier ripening yeah if if i mi if i mix them up i apologize so 2020 is lighter in alcohol i picked it lighter because we were having those heat spikes um you know this past year in california those massive heat waves so i picked it earlier um 2017 um we did have a fire in 2017 but we actually didn't have those santa barbara fires until december which was after uh, harvest was over. I was kind of like very end of November, beginning of December when we got, we, 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 we were set ablaze. So, um, for me in 2020, definitely I picked what I, I would say not by much, you know, we're talking about one or two weeks. Um, and, and then the difference is the 20, the 2017 resulting in a little bit higher of alcohol, um, where the 2020 was 12, eight. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Maybe we'll come back to you at the end for more questions and feel free to chime in whenever you'd like with these, the rest of our guests here. Um, now let's move to uh, Andrew Murray, the uh, esteemed uh, veteran on uh, the panel today. Uh, you can just we, say the old guy. The old guy on the <laughs> panel today. <laughs> uh, Andrew started uh, way back when. I was actually just talking to Andy Walker from Davis on the phone and we were talking about some great mistakes. And, and if I remember your story correctly, you thought you planted a bunch of Viognier and suddenly there was Syrah. And uh, now you're one of the more celebrated Syrah makers in, uh, in the state, if not the world. So tell us a little bit about your story, Andrew, and I'm going to pour this 18 Syrah uh, while you do so. Yeah, it was, um, it was a bit of a mistake. We, we fell in love with Viognier in Burgundy and decided as a family to plant Viognier um, along Fox and Canyon Road. And Angela, you said your first vintage or your first experience was out at Demetria. That was my first experience as well. <laughs> we planted that back in um, between 1990 and, and um, finished planting in about 1995. Um, but yeah, we, we wanted to grow a bunch of Viognier. We thought that made a lot of sense. Um, we wanted to make Condria and Chateau Grier in Santa Barbara County. And, and thankfully the, um, the Klein cuttings, the Klein cellar cuttings that we purchased from Sonoma grapevines, they were misidentified as dormant cuttings. And um, we had mostly Syrah. Um, and we started in 1990, we made our first wine in 1993. It was all Syrah, 94 was all Syrah, 95 was all Syrah, and then 96, we finally had a little bit of Viognier that we had planted um, and subsequent vintages that we could actually make a Viognier. But in 96, we also started blending Syrah and Viognier um, to make a wine that we called Roasted Slope. And it is a good little segue to, um, to Watch Hill because we actually do co-ferment a little bit of Viognier in the more modern versions of this wine. We weren't doing it back in 2011, but we, um, we did do it in, um, I think every vintage since 2014. 
Um, when I was uh, doing D Demetria, it used to be called Andrew Murray Vineyards over there. Um, my family didn't want me involved in any other uh, side hustles. Um, I was paid a pittance to uh, live in a um, double wide there on the property with my new wife. And we were starting to raise a family and um, I was getting, uh, I don't know, a bit of stink eye. It just, it, it wasn't this amazing situation, but um, along the way people had asked me, um, they thought maybe I must know something about growing grapes because we'd been there a few years. But I remember John O'Donnell asking my wife and I out to dinner at, um, at a vineyard that became Watch Hill. And um, he asked me my uh, advice about planting a vineyard. And I said, it's a terrible idea. Um, you should spend any money that you'd ever want on any bottle without a care. And you will spend less money than getting into the wine business. And you could drink like a king for the rest of your life. Um, thankfully, he didn't take my advice. Um, and he decided to plant a vineyard. He hired Coastal Vineyard Care. And um, I actually, my wife and I, when we went up there for dinner, the only other crazy story was um, we thought maybe it was, we were going to get murdered out there. Um, when we got out there, there was no furniture. Um, it was just us. Um, there was a big, no big plastic sheet. Yeah, it was, yeah, it wasn't quite, um, it wasn't quite like, uh, Oh, what's that movie? No, it wasn't that bad, but we got out there and um, he was giving us a little tour of the house and there was just nothing there. It was just horse pasture in all directions. And so we spent most of our time walking around and looking at the very, very sandy soil, the, um, the steep sort of south, southwest facing slopes. Um, I mean, it looked like a place you could grow grapes, but it was so pockmarked with, uh, with corrals. It seemed like an expensive endeavor to convert those horse corrals to, um, to vineyard. And so we told them like, hey, it's a terrible idea. You know, I think you should, you should cease and desist. And uh, you know, I'm glad that there was actually a meal there. They had a, a dinner catered. We weren't murdered clearly. And uh, um, we became really close friends through the years. Um, but the, uh, the meaningful part of that story is that when my family sold in 2005 and we were um, we needed to move on, we realized that we had built our whole identity around an estate vineyard um, that we no longer had access to. I wasn't, um, I wasn't provided with contracts. It wasn't allowed. Um, John O'Donnell and the new ownership there, excuse me, um, John Zahudanis and his family had, you know, wanted to first write a refusal on all the grapes. It made perfect sense. So I was suddenly a winemaker uh, who focused on Syrah and Rhone varieties and an estate program without a vineyard source. And my first phone call, um, once it was made more public that my family had sold was from John O'Donnell. And he said, hey, you can have any block you want. Um, and so we took a small block that first year. Um, we'd actually worked with the wine the two years just before just getting our, our, our feet in the water over there, but um, and I think now we have about, I think we have five or six acres under contract um, there. Um, and it was, it's always been my favorite vineyard that we work with. I, my family um, bought the property along Fox and Canyon Road before we really knew what we were gonna do. Clearly we thought we were gonna make Viognier, um, but. Well, and you can see, you can see Demetria here if people aren't, if you're looking at the screens, it's uh, oh yeah, it's right here. It's right next to. I mean, it's just over the hill from Lisa's. What's now Lisa's Canyon too. So you were in the ballpark from the get go. We were, but man, I I explained to almost anyone who will listen to my boring spiel about how much I love Lisa's Canyon. Is I always say I I wish we'd found that that canyon. There wasn't a lot of activity over there. I mean, Thompson was was coming in. Lisa's Vineyard was there for a long time before we were, or right, you know, just before we were. But um, obviously, Zaka Mesa was a very important neighbor, and our property was right behind Zaka Mesa, and so we felt that was a that was a you know a very positive um, opportunity. But man, the minute we started working with Alisos Canyon, it just started to deliver and exhibit flavors and characteristics of Syrah that I so admired from the Northern Rhone. You know, ferrous iron qualities, almost like you when you bite the inside of your your cheek accidentally, you get that little bit of blood note. Meat, um, 
white pepper, candied violet. It's just an amazing, amazing address um, all along there for Syrah. It's cool climate, but enough ripeness, you know, enough natural alcohol, enough consistency from vintage to vintage and ripeness that you can make just really sensational wines. Even in a difficult vintage like 2011, it was difficult to ripen that year. And then in an absolutely easy vintage like 2018. So both of the wines that were, um, that we're showing today. Um, I fell in love immediately with the sand, the streak of calcareous, um, the little split up hillsides of Watch Hill. But we've worked for years with Thompson Vineyard, Alisos Vineyard, and now um, it's exhibited there on the map as flower and vine right, right next to uh, Martian. And now we're working with um, Nolan, which is one of the sort of newest, um, more audacious vineyard plantings out there. Beautiful vineyard. We're, we got from fruit from three different blocks last year. I think it was first, first harvest off those vines. And um, in a difficult vintage like 2020, the wines show um, grace and elegance. Um, uh, I'm, I'm super excited about the potential out at Nolan. Um, they planted quite a bit out there. We actually, I make a tiny bit of wine every year just for fun and education. And we bought some Nolan fruit this year too. We got a really high brick. So it's a, it's a, it's a potent wine. Uh, it's but, a bruiser, huh? uh, yeah, but, um, but they planted a bunch and obviously you can see it's a big planting compared to everything else here. Yeah. Some of us, like I remember drawing the boundaries of Demetria and thinking it would be cool to, uh, to make it look big. Um, but that's this, that's the whole ranch, but at Demetria, they probably have what 50 acres of vines. That's about what we had when we left. Um, so sometimes people circle their entire ranch rather than the, um, the vineyards the that are within range, the ranch. Yeah. So, but yeah, Nolan is a good sized planting. It's, um, it's impressive hillside, some higher elevation stuff. Um, it's a certainly, a, a you know, further inland, um, expression of, uh, of Alisos Canyon, um, Oh, we've also worked a lot with Black Oak. I see that on there. Uh, we worked all over Aliso's Canyon. I'm telling you, it's, it's the best place for Syrah in Santa Barbara County. I mean, everyone will tell you their favorite spot, but um, not just because we're talking about Aliso's Canyon today. It's, it's been my favorite since the very first time I was lucky enough to get fruit from out there. And if I could lift my winery up using a helicopter or some magic, I would drop it <laughs> somewhere between Nolan and, uh, and Thompson. <laughs> and you're down dream come true. <laughs> If people want to come taste Andrew Murray wines now, you're down here at Curtis Estate, essentially, right, right on Fox and Canyon. Zach, 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 right where Zach uh, Station and Fox and Canyon meet. It's right at the corner, really. It literally is at the crossroads it's there. Fine. Uh, and we're we're Great. we're making Syrah there from the estate now as well. It's just a slightly different expression. It's riper. It's a little bit warmer. Um, I think it's great. Um, but we're just getting the more perfect version of Syrah from from Aliso's Canyon Road. And I would agree with Jessica. I mean, given all my experience out there, I think it's a really magical spot for Gamay. I mean, I, I haven't been lucky enough to try it yet, um, but I can't wait to. Um, and, uh, and certainly Grenache. I think it's a cooler climate expression of Grenache that, um, that um, Angela's able to work with out there. And, and I think we're gonna get to, Stevens has a petite Syrah. I have long admired those Jaffers Petite Syrahs. It's a, a level of ripeness and beautiful natural acidity that they get that's just uh, not that common with relatively younger vines. It's beautiful. So there's, yeah. there's good diversity, but of course, I think the whole canyon should be planted with Syrah. But that's just <laughs> my, my bias. <laughs> right. Well, we'll come um, back to you, Andrew, when we, when yeah. we get into your 11 on the end. Um, but while I have this map, if I do want to note, of Thompson Vineyard, the, the new owners, they bought it well, quite a while ago now, but the, uh, Noah Rolls, um, he was the guy that actually pushed for the Alisos Canyon AVA um, with the help of Wes Hagen, who is the guy that has written almost all of the AVAs in Santa Barbara County. He does all the research and puts it all together. Um, and so Noah gets a big slap on the back for getting this thing going. And then another one, the third twin um, is Mack and Prankle's vineyard in Elisa's Canyon. So Santa Quinon, you know, some of the most expensive wine in, uh, in the world is coming to uh, Elisa's Canyon to pull some fruit. So that's probably worth noting as well. Um, all right, let's move on to uh, Steven and um, some Petit Syrah here. Uh, let me see, let me pin him. Replace pin. There we go. All right, Stephen. Um, 
how you doing? You've been with Jaffers quite a while. Jaffers has been, Jaffers was actually one of the first, uh, er, other than Santa Barbara winery, which started back in like 64. Uh, Jaffers is an urban winery in, in Santa Barbara on the east side, um, you know, in a community near a lot of Mexican restaurants and uh, grocery stores and gas stations. And then there's this amazing uh, place to, to make wine. Uh, I've been going there for probably 20 years now. Uh, enjoying the wines and, and Stephen's been there quite a while and, and was named head winemaker a few years ago. So Stephen, tell us about your background uh, and then we can get into this uh, petite Syrah before we get into your older Syrah. Sounds good. Yeah. So I, um, I got into wine working in restaurants, actually. I, I started uh, college studying music out in Boston and was working in some terrific restaurants that had great wine programs and uh, learned very quickly that I had this other passion that I had no idea, um, no idea of. I didn't grow up in a, in a wine drinking family, um, but I very quickly decided to shift focus and um, transferred out to uh, Cal Poly up in SLO and did the uh, Enology Viticulture program there and graduated in, uh, in 2010. Um, bounced around for a couple of years um, and then landed down here in Santa Barbara in 2012. That was my first vintage uh, with Jaffer. So I've been there for quite some time now. Um, so I have a 2012 Syrah. Actually, that was my first year at the winery. I didn't make that wine. I started um, as a uh, humble seller assistant, kind of grunt doing everything. And, um, and then I've been making the wine. I, I was uh, pre previously the assistant winemaker. And then when the winery sold um, in 2016, the next vintage, uh, I started making the wines as the winemaker in 2017. Um, but Jaffers has a very uh, long history in Aliso's Canyon and with uh, Thompson Vineyard specifically. So Craig Jaffers, our founding winemaker, um, started his winery getting fruit from Thompson Vineyard. Uh, he, uh, he made Syrah from there, um, which we're still in the same block uh, that he got his fruit from in 94. It also happened to be the same year that the vineyard came into production. So it was planted in 1990 and uh, their first year harvesting a crop uh, in the vineyard was 94, which was also Craig's first year making the wine. So we have a, a really great history with them. Um, we've sort of grown together and we're getting, uh, it's, if not more, we're getting probably more grapes from that one site than any other place. Maybe with the exception of Biendecito, it's probably about uh, half and half right now. But uh, Jaffer's really made its name uh, with Syrah and road varietals in particular. Um, so we make six different bottlings of Syrah from sites all over the county. Um, and right now at Thompson, we're getting the Syrah, uh, Petite Syrah, and Morbed. Um, so the first one is the Petite Syrah. So that started for Jaffers in 2002. That was actually a collaboration with a local restaurant. And uh, we were basically making the wine for them. We were going to bottle it with their label and sell it exclusively for the, for the restaurant. Well, the restaurant uh, shut their doors before the wine uh, was ready to bottle. And so we were stuck with a couple barrels of Petite Syrah and uh, Craig and Dave, our previous general manager, Dave actually headed the project in the first year. So he made that, that first wine, um, decided to, why not? We'll just bottle it as a Jaffer's wine. Um, it tasted great. Steven, yeah. sorry, did, did you say which restaurant it was? I don't know, actually. Uh, okay. It was before my time here. Okay. And it's, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure. You could, you could hit Dave up and he'd be able to tell you. All right. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so we, you know, the, the Petite Syrah program, it, it's, it's just grown and grown every year. Um, and right now it's our third largest production wine behind the Santa Barbara County Syrah and the Viognier. So it's really one of our core wines. Um, a lot of people know us for the Petite Syrah, even though we, we only make the one bottling of it, but, um, but people love it. And it's one of our most popular, most successful wines. Um, so for the 2018 uh, vintage, we actually have, it was our first year getting um, our third block there. So we're in three different areas on the vineyard for Petit Syrah. And we made quite a bit of it, uh, almost 600 cases. Um, so we have um, the original Petit 
planting, which was planted in 97 um, on its own roots. And then, and I wanna say 2005, they grafted over some uh, Cab Franc vines to Petite Syrah in the original side of the vineyard. So that was planted in 1990, but they grafted it to Petite Syrah in 05. Um, so we, we have blocks on both sides of the vineyard. And then just a few years ago, I think it was 2016, they grafted over um, some Pinot Gris uh, for us to, to Petite Syrah. So now we're, we have three different Petite Syrah picks out there. Um, 2018 was a really great vintage. I, I loved that year. It was uh, quite cool. It was actually a nice warm summer leading up to fall, but once the harvest started, um, it got cold and stayed cold. So it was a really late, long year. Um, for me, it's just a perfect growing season. Uh, but it was harvested quite late. I, I think all of our blocks were well into November. Um, it's one of the last things we pick every year. Um, and then we actually use a little American oak on this wine. This is the one wine uh, in our program that we use American oak on just because it's, there's so much going on in Petit Sarah, it can actually handle that little stamp, uh, that extra stamp of oak that, uh, that, that American barrels give. Um, we're looking at the vineyard map here. And so here's some PS and Petit Sarah here. Um, someone was asking about more vet. This is some more vet in the back actually of, of Thompson Vineyard. Um, what that, I like- a, That block two uh, E is the original petite planting right here. even though that was the second side of the vineyard to be planted overall that was the first petite syrah and then 1d is where it was grafted in 05 great what I, what I like about it and there's not there's only really one other example i can think of from the wines that i taste from the central coast um is that it really is like this cool climate syrah so you get these peppery aspects i mean i taste a good amount of petite syrah and it tends to be really just a big brooding um, you know, just some big wines, a lot of tannins, and these are these have way more. This has way more finesse, way more freshness, a little of that pepper spice that you associate with a cooler climate Syrah. And the only other one I taste like this is from um, Wolf Vineyard up in Edna Valley, which is a, an even cooler site to grow Petit Syrah. I get the sense that they can't get it ripe sometimes, um, but I don't know. There's this cool climate ness that I didn't think you could get in Petit Syrah, probably because we don't see it grown in in these cooler climates all that often, right? Yeah, and for me, um, what's kind of remarkable about the Petite Syrah, and I, I think could be attributed to the climate. Well, for one, it, it holds its acidity really well. Um, so we never have to acidulate it. We pick it fairly ripe. Um, and even though it's on a cooler vineyard, it always gets ripe, but we just have to let it hang for a long time. Um, but it always has a lot of fresh acidity. Um, so we don't, it doesn't drop its acid. And then texturally also, and I, I think that comes from the extra hang time that we get in the cool climate site. Um, Petit Syrah can often have really, really hard angular tannins, uh, especially when it's young. And there's always been um, kind of a silky, uh, silkiness to the texture and an approachability to the Jaffer's Petit Syrah that I think is, is uh, unique. Right. Um, was were people surprised at how well, how quickly it grew as a program? Because I remember when it started, it was like a little niche thing. And now it sounds like it's quite a massive part of everything. Yeah. I mean, it's just snowballed over the years. I don't know if anybody was really, I think, I think Craig might've been a little shocked at first because it was kind of a, a small project that I don't think he was totally sold on. He had to be um, talked into it by his GM at the time. Uh, and then I know that they, the story was they sent off that first bottling for review and it did great. So they thought, well, I guess we'll keep it on. So I think he might've been a little surprised by that. And, uh, you know, I mean, because it is a, it's a big extracted wine. Um, it's dark, there's a lot of fruit to it. So it always stands out in a, in a lineup and um, people in the tasting room just go crazy for it. All right. Let's move on to the Syrah, and um, we have some wine here with a little bit of age on it, which is always fun. Uh, and tasting it this morning, I haven't tasted it again just now, but it's been open for a couple hours. Um, I was surprised by, on both these wines, that your 12 and, and then Andrew's 11, 
uh, how much freshness remained. Uh, I mean, you, you're starting to get just a tinge of that like older wine kind of character, um, but there's still like this kind of pop to it, which is which is always a good sign of ageability in, a, in an appellation. Yeah, I just I just tasted it, and you're right. There's there's tons of freshness in this wine, and it's still. I mean, the structure is still there. It's not tannic. It's shed a lot of those kind of more um, more youthful tannins, but it still has that dusty quality to it. And I think it can go for a lot longer. Um, it, we're in the uh, block 1B here, kind of towards the top of the hill. Um, and like I mentioned before, it was uh, the, first, the first Syrah that Craig made. And uh, it was the original planting on the vineyard. So it's actually the oldest Syrah that we work with right now. And probably some of the older Syrah in the county. Uh, it's about 30 years at this point, a little more. Um, and then it spends about two years in barrel, a little bit of new oak, 25 or so percent, and is all destemmed. Um, one thing about this Syrah from Thompson, I to me, it, it tends to be our most elegant Syrah, we make Syrah from about four or five vineyards. And uh, this ha always has more of a red fruit character to it and a, sort of a prettiness, a, a floral aspect, maybe like a pipe tobacco quality um, that I really love. And even though it is probably the most elegant Syrah we make, it also ages beautifully. Great. Uh, Stephen, I'm gonna, I want you to plug your own brand too. You make some delicious wines under your own uh, oh, label. Tell you. us about that quickly. Yeah, in 2016, I started um, making uh, some of my own wines under the Leitmotif label. Um, and I actually do get a little bit of fruit from Aliso's Canyon as well. So I get some, my white wine comes from Martian. It's a, uh, a blend of Grenache Blanc and Viognier that I harvest together and press together. So it's almost a, like a field blend. Um, and then I also, I make a little bit of uh, Pinot from Duvarita Vineyard, which is a far Western vineyard just outside of the, uh, out of the, out of the San Rita Hills Appalachian, um, as well as Kick On, which is sort of the other side of Los Alamos, getting way out uh, towards Vandenberg. You and can then, almost see it. It's like out here. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be well, out, it'd be quite a ways past the 101, like sort of another, if the map went west as far as it goes east, you'd probably be able to see it. Right. Um, and then I make a little bit of Syrah from Edna Valley, uh, from the uh, Slide Hill Vineyard up in Edna Valley. Great. Well, thank you, Stephen. These wines are delicious. Um, I hope everyone enjoys that Petit Syrah. It's, like I said, it's rare that you get cool climb Petit Syrah. And I think, I mean, it's not going to be a big cash crop or anything in the future, but uh, I think it's something to watch for, for people that know that it's happening and, and where to get it. And, and Jaffa's is obviously a leader in that regard. So, and search out Stephen's wines. They are in fact delicious. Whereas the Jaffers can be kind of bolder and richer. Stephen's really exploring kind of that lighter edge of uh, wine in his own brand. So it's a nice uh, counterpoint as well too so um andrew let's cut back to you and talk about your 11 uh syrah and i i, I want to hear your thoughts on you know ageability of of uh syrah in general um and uh you know specifically elisa's Can uh, canyon yeah um that's it's it's 10 years old now that wine and it's i think it's still a baby in a lot of ways it is showing probably the beginning signs of you know some of those tertiary or secondary bottle age characteristics that you would expect. Um, I opened a bottle before I decided I would send it to everyone to make sure that it was still as fresh as I remembered. Um, but that was the last time I got to have it was a, over a week ago. Um, and then I gave the bottle to our staff, to someone on our team to take home. Um, but I was smitten with it, how fresh it was and um, great natural acidity that you tend to get from Aliso's Canyon yet still had some, some fundamental ripeness, um, some bright red fruits, but the wine was more savory than um, the current vintage, the 2018 for sure. We're using a little bit more um, new oak now, not a whole lot, but there's a little bit more sort of pencil lead um, characteristics. It also shows in the younger wine as well. Um, I just love the, how sort of ferrous and um, 
iron rich that wine tastes to me like it it's just got a, a real bloody kind of meaty Syrah characteristic which I just love in Syrah um, there's a good and, question um, from um, from Krista um, is there a reason that the Syrah gets planted at the top of a slope and or hill in these vineyards is it a soil thing or cloud cover thing or just a coincidence huh I mean there's you know, everyone wants to plant wine on, red wine on hillsides. You know, it seems like that's the, the thing to do. And it's so strange because, you know, like I, I think about a different paradigm, think about Cabernet that everyone loves to get high up on the hillsides. And there's, you know, if you go to the home of, the original home of Cabernet, if you go to Bordeaux, it's sort of on slopes next to rivers, um, gravelly slopes next to rivers. It reminds me more of the Napa Valley floor than the Napa Valley hillsides. But um, to be honest, in Alisos Canyon, I think getting it up on the hills really helps because yeah, you don't wanna be down uh, where all that fog and all that wetness is, is lingering all day long. You're gonna be much more prone to mildew. Uh, it'll be even riper, uh, even later ripening. Um, and um, it, just, it just may make a bit of a mess when it finally gets to the winery. I mean, we always love Watch Hill because the grapes come in so crunchy, no matter how late or early we pick it. You know, Syrah's famous for looking like a, a dimpled golf ball. Um, there's all kinds of terrible names we give that characteristic, but it's very baggy and dimpling by the time it's picked in general. And Watch Hill for us has none of that. It's the most, um, it almost is actually like a petite Syrah. Uh, we work with a little bit of petite Syrah from a different vineyard and it's, that's a very crunchy grape, um, very firm skins and, and it could be partially clonal, um, but I don't know if it's, it's also just sort of site specific to Watch Hill. But we work with fruit from directly behind it at Black Oak. We work with fruit you know, from all over and it's the only sort of crunchy fruit that we get. And it, it you know, sometimes we sort it if it's, if it's been a really terrible vintage or a difficult vintage like last year. So we had a lot of raisins, um, a lot of difficult ripening clusters. So we, we did berry sorting on that and then crushed it. Um, but it, it sorts really, really well. It stays intact. It doesn't break over the sorting table. Um, it's just an amazing, amazing, amazing sight. And I've never a hundred percent understood it, but it just always made magical wines. Um, everyone who makes wine out of there, I, I always admire those. And I seem to be able to start to pick it out now. I think it's got a distinctive quality. Um, and there's is, a good question about screw tops. That's part yeah, of why that, ask, so. that <laughs> wine will probably age better than all the others just because we made, we switched all of our wine to screw tops in 2000. No, um, excuse me. We switched uh, in the, in the late, Early 2000s, we switched everything to screw top and then we switched away in about 2013. Um, just got tired of, I go on the road to sell wine and only thing everyone ever wanted to talk to me about was why screw tops? Um, and see it, we're talking about it now. <laughs> um, I think all wine should be closed in a screw top personally. I'm a, I'm a big believer in them. I think our wines are aging so gracefully our white wines are um, we have like viognier that is famous for not aging you know going back to those early screw top years in the early 2000s and they're they're as fresh as the day we bottled them um, and i just love screw tops i can't say enough nice things about it i bought a quarter million dollar machine so i could screw top my own wine actually a half a million dollar machine so i could do it myself and um and now we don't do a whole lot of screw top what, we just the market wasn't supporting it or no, no, we sold all of our wine every year. It, to be honest, we, I just got tired of talking about it. I got tired of being the champion of screw tops. Um, it's as simple as that. And then we, I mean, we don't use natural cork now, we use Diam. And so we think it's a decent um, replacement for natural cork, but we had such a high incidence of cork taint in our wine that it was, um, I just couldn't, I couldn't realize, I couldn't rationalize that we worked so hard. We grew these grapes, we spent all this money, we aged it and we bottle it. And then the wine would get screwed up during that final process in the aging. Um, and it just bothered me, bothered me. I hate cork bottles of wine. And now it's amazing how much better cork has gotten natural cork. I mean, we, I don't open a lot of corked wines. Um, 
from anybody. So course it's gotten better. But those early middle years when the wine business was expanding like crazy, um, cork forests were having a bit of a shortage. There were challenges and there was just, there were a bunch of bad batches of cork. And I think it was just a bad time for me to be in the wine business. And I made this snap decision, like I'm out. So I literally just shut the door on cork one day. Um, yeah. And I didn't regret it, but I'm happy that we use something that looks like a cork again today. So. <laughs> I mean, I just want to echo that, that point that Andrew just made from natural cork to, to I think you said you use DM. Uh, and the two gamets that I sent out to y'all, uh, one was natural cork and one is actually zinc, which is a, you know, um, cork supplies version of DM. A great cork. Uh, awesome. You know, on uh, 2000 cases, you know, I was honestly a lot of corked wine, um, which was devastating for us. So I made the decision a few years ago to switch over and I will never, ever look back on that. Great. Well, uh, I think we've covered a lot about you guys, a lot about uh, the wines we're drinking, a good amount about Aliso's Canyon. I hope people are excited about this uh, small appellation and, and find it worthy to, to seek stuff out. Uh, any more questions from you guys before we sign off? All right. Uh, if not, I don't know, Lacey, do you wanna, you wanna take us out here or? Thank you all for attending. Yeah, thank you guys so much for taking the time. I know that everyone's busy doing a ton of virtual tastings these days. Um, so thank you so much for, for taking the time to be with us. We appreciate it. Thank you.